Hello everyone and welcome to, to a new edition of Logout Cafe, episode 44. Uh, for those of you that are new to this event, it's uh, a get together that we do every week, same day, same hour, where we get together with our team, with the community and uh, with uh, potential customers, new leads to discuss low code, to look at what's coming in the releases and then uh, look at uh, stories that are discussed on our uh, support channels. And uh, the biggest chunk of this uh, event is actually uh, hand, the hands-on part where we actually low code, uh, use low code to achieve real world, uh, to solve real world problems. Uh, my name is Bogdan Izescu. I am uh, the CEO and founder of Plant and App, and uh, I'm doing the uh, intro for our awesome team. We'll have, uh, uh, we'll have uh, Dale, our head of support, uh, giving us the trenches, the, from the trenches part. And then we'll have uh, Reza Gero, our head of product, and with, uh, together with Manu, uh, our own Manu uh, from, uh, from the QA team. They will be showing uh, some uh, uh, very uh, nice techniques uh, to uh, enforce security. And this is actually the third part in a series of webinars. Uh, for the previous weeks, uh, we, uh, the team uh, showed how to imp properly implement a security uh, uh, authentication mechanism into, into applications. And today is the third and final part uh, where it's about uh, revalidating users when uh, they lose a certain level of trust. And uh, all these events uh, are recorded. They are uh, on our YouTube channel. So I invite you to check them out. We'll post the link also in the chat window. Check it out, uh, subscribe, uh, stay tuned. Uh, besides this uh, local cafe series, there, there are a lot more uh, videos on uh, trainings and cool techniques. Cool. So without, uh, without further ado, I, uh, I bring it to Dale to give us the From the Trenches uh, part. All right. Hello, everyone. Let's see if I can find my right screen here. Okay. Um, well, welcome, everyone. Um, today, we are, um, I, I had several um, things to talk about and some announcements to make. So here we go. Um, one of, uh, one of our um, uh, Team members, Patrick Anderson, has put together a new low-code feature focus on the same channel that uh, Bogdan was just mentioning. It's um, on our low-code feature focus um, playlist. There are a number of videos out there, but this one is all about how to use the new Plant and App SQL console. So it you know, goes through uh, start to finish. You'll see, for example, that there are uh, there are chapters. Uh, established in it so you can see how to set up the permissions and enable it, how to run it, um, what exactly happens, what logging happens. So um, I invite you to, uh, that's, a, that's a new video that was posted this week, a lot of good information in, in 10 minutes time. Um, I wanted to talk today particularly about a case that, an interesting case that came across uh, support and involved development a client that wanted to um, work with a listing or a grid to accomplish running totals and um, was thinking about doing it in, in JavaScript with a lot of front end work. And it uh, turns out that we found a solution for them that I think really could uh, apply to uh, in, in many instances. So hopefully this technique will be of use to you. Um, at least to, to have it in your back pocket. So we have a um, a screen here that has uh, by months, we're, we're doing projected billings and it was uh, already built to have a running total. So 500 plus 2,000 to 2,500 plus another 15,000. And so the, the objective was to be able to um, enter directly into the screen and to have these running totals adjust immediately. So for example, if I change this to zero, that we see all the running totals adjust all the way down. Uh, same way here. And um, so just as soon as you're making it, uh, making the adjustment, we're seeing the update on the screen. So what we, what we put together to do that um, 
was uh, really a couple of, really two techniques that I'll cover. One is we set up an auto save of the column and the other is an auto refresh of the grid. So the auto save was done uh, through, um, if we go into the API, well, I built a simple API um, that um, I'm going to edit. It's, very, it's really a very straightforward uh, where we just accept a new month-to-date build amount. Uh, so we accept a, a key and a month-to-date build amount, and then we run a SQL query that just updates the, the underlying table where the key is uh, the key specified and the month-to-date build. Now, we didn't actually implement security or, or uh, anything. This is really more of a proof of concept, so you'd have to be a little bit more advanced than this. But uh, this, this API then allows you to call, um, and I'm gonna look at the sample code. Um, this, this API with this code would allow you to update a, um, a, a particular month's month-to-date build. So the next step we did is I copied out this, uh, this jQuery that's here because I'm gonna, I, I used it in the grid. And so I'm gonna go back to our dynamic running totals grid or listing. And um, if we edit that, the forecast updates listing, um, the setup of this is that um, we have two columns and one of the columns is a, uh, is a form setup. So to the form, we've added month-to-date build and these other fields haven't implemented anything ex uh, else on these month-to-date, uh, except month-to-date build. But uh, month-to-date build gets initialized from the grid, month-to-date build column. And then in the on change click, we, I used that SQL query and I've, I've uh, advanced it a little bit uh, for the auto refresh, but the, the auto save part of it is that we run the Ajax query to our API we pass the key ID and the new month-to-date build amount. So what's happening here is, is um, whenever they do an on-change click, whenever they click and do something in that column, it's automatically, immediately, or almost immediately being saved. And I say almost immediately because the rest of this co code is, uh, there's some, some work that got done uh, to prevent it from keystroke by keystroke saving. I actually implemented a, a 1500 millisecond timeout. And so uh, through this technique, when they start typing, actually when they stop typing and leave it alone for uh, um, a second and a half, is 1500 milliseconds, this timeout executes and so it does a page refresh. So we're, um, uh, we're first, as they type, it's saving it to the database, but but the refresh happens automatically. We've passed in the module ID for this. Now, uh, in a minute, when I get done talking, I'll post the links to where all this code was discussed on the particular case so that uh, you can have it if you want to use it. Um, but, uh, you know, again, the, the impact that we get out of it is that um, the, the refresh happens, um, automatically, the save happens automatically and our, our totals are updated. Uh, one of the things, uh, again, we, when we started out, we started out with a solution where we were going to change uh, these display totals through JavaScript and they were just going to be cosmetic. But by doing it uh, this way, even if we're filtered on a particular column, it wouldn't matter. Or if the sort order was backwards, it wouldn't matter. We wouldn't have to take any of that into, into consideration because we're just saving data and then refreshing the grid and letting SQL do all the work. So that's, uh, that's the technique that we uh, got today. We did auto save and auto refresh. A couple of announcements coming up um, for the net. We're, we're starting a new feature. We're, um, it, it, it may become permanent, but we're committed to at least the, the next three weeks. We're going to do something called low code campfire. Um, watch for that um, uh, email later this afternoon. You'll be invited to it, but it's this same hour coming up on Friday. And uh, the idea is that we're, it's, it's just a community gathering, an opportunity to come together. Uh, I'll be hosting it and uh, 
but the idea is to share whether it's techniques that you have, uh, particular business problems that you're trying to accomplish, uh, maybe get some feedback from whether it's from our support team or from the community about, well, have you tried this or you could go this direction. You're just showing off a little show and tell around the campfire, the digital campfire. Uh, and then uh, a little teaser for next week, we're going to have a special guest from our community do a, a, a presentation about some, some uh, a technique that he's implemented in an application for an end client. And uh, so it's a pretty neat thing. And then, um, so uh, again, I, we hope to see you next week on that. Um, and at that, I will pass it over to Reza and stop my sharing. Um, Reza is going to talk about uh, this continuation, this two-factor authentication with, um, I think he's going to do it with Google, but it's the idea is when our, uh, uh, our um, automatic login um, time period has expired that uh, we, we just verify, hey, is it really you? Reza, good morning. Hey, good morning. Thanks, Dale. Yeah, uh, we've got a really, really good one today. Uh, the culmination of kind of the buildup of what we've been doing the last couple of weeks is coming together. And, and uh, you know, a lot of that block and tackle kind of stuff that you've got to set up in the beginning, just like what plant an app is to app building, where you've got to create entities and have forms and all of that. And we kind of give you that before you can start doing the magic. And so last couple of weeks, we've been kind of uh, building upon having the ability to remember a user uh and then log them in automatically and this week is going to be about well what happens when i'm not so sure that this user is who they say they are or they're um coming from somewhere that i don't know and we can um we have a, uh, three different uh second factors that we can challenge them with and then uh let them pass or not rather than just automatically log them in before I jump into that, though, I just wanted to give a real quick update on the release. Uh, we're in 114 right now. Things are going well. Um, we've got uh, uh, several new kind of features and goodies coming. Uh, one of them is a big one that as, as we're looking at our um, app today that we're building, uh, we'll see that, that it will come in very handy. And so I don't want to take a lot of time today. We've got a lot to show, so I want to make sure I leave us a, a good chance for that and a chance for some questions. I um, just want to say things are progressing on track, and probably two weeks from now, um, we'll go ahead and I'll demo some of the new features, um, including the ability to have namespaces for grouping your workflows and your entities. Um, just wanted to make sure everyone knows also that this release, we're not just uh, shipping new features, but uh, putting a lot of work into the issues that are coming in through Community Center, the uh, community portal, um, and uh, really with a focus on taming date time and kind of standardizing that and making that easier to work with across the board. So with that said, so be on the lookout in a couple of weeks and I'll, I'll demo the new stuff. Um, with that said, let me uh, show you. Uh, I think the best place to start would be just to kind of show what we've got built uh, so far. Quick refresher, we'll see it in action, and then it'll make more sense when we peel back the layers and see how it was built. So here I'm on uh, Firefox browser. I'm gonna, gonna go in as a regular user who has no um, building abilities. They're just a user of this application. I'm going to go to log in. And so you'll notice a lot of times uh, by default, your portals, because uh, all of the pages are set by default to kind of um, only let logged in users of some sort see a page, you usually end up landing right on this login page. Uh, one thing I did here was I, I set the uh, home page to be allowed to be viewable by anybody, right? And so um, uh, because of that, we're actually seeing the home page, and I have the ability to click on the login or go to the login page. And it's really important at, at, at when you're building or when we're doing this Remember Me that we had this because when I do log in and I set the Remember Me, what it does the next time it sees me and I'm not logged in is it's going to automatically log me in. Well, if this was the main page or the landing page that got hit every time, like it normally is, I would be stuck in an endless loop of just 
logging in and logging in and logging in. And I'd never be able to um, access this page on demand um, and things like that. So kind of important if you're going to build something like this and turn a feature like this on that you make sure that this is not the default place where users land, that they either are brought here because they tried to, they were redirected from a page that did have some security, role-based security on it, and it said, hey, you need to log in, and after you do, I'll, I'll return you back here. That's that return URL you see. <coughs> Excuse me. And, uh, or you've chosen to log in and you come here. So uh, I've got, you know, just a standard user set up here. And when I, log in as this user, I'm going to go ahead and say to remember me. And if we remember from, from the past weeks, when I'm doing this, it's setting some cookies uh, on uh, encrypted cookies into my browser. So it is browser specific so that the next time I hit this page and whenever this page is hit, one of the first things it always does is it looks for those cookies and says, is this person supposed to be remembered? Are we within the 30 day period? If so, let's go run some uh, workflow business logic that will kind of navigate the waters. And we'll take a look at that in a second uh, and figure out what to do with them. So in this case, uh, I, I, I was clean and I said, forget me on this device. So it, it didn't remember me and it was saying, okay, uh, let me log you in. Now, one thing I did for us, since this app really is just focused on all the work's been done in the login page, uh, I did just add a thing up here that if a user is logged in, it lets you know, hey, you're logged in as somebody. So we can just see the difference of when I'm logged in versus I'm not. Um, We'll go here to profile and preferences and uh, you'll see that there's a couple of new things um, and you know one of them is that uh, I have the ability to generate a second factor of authentication using the Google Authenticator code. So I'll go ahead and do that now. We'll see how all this was built. Actually, I won't do that now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna build this up in steps. So I've logged in and uh, that's it. Now, if I log out, and I go back to log in, you'll see that I was challenged. And that's because uh, my IP address is not matching uh, what was remembered or seen in the past. And so uh, there's, uh, there's a new feature now that uh, the logic doesn't just say, do I know this person logged them in, but rather is the IP address uh, different than what I've recorded for the user? If it is, you're prompted with three different options. And, and we're gonna just take a look at these in kind of order of maybe uh, complexity and coolness. Uh, so the first one is just, hey, I can choose to log in with my credentials. I can either get a code, a one-time pin from an email that'll be sent uh, and I'll be prompted to put it in. And Manu's gonna walk us through that one, he built that one. Uh, and the last one being, I'm, I have the Google Authenticator app on my mobile device and uh, we're gonna see how to uh, sync it or connect it up um, to this application and then be able to get uh, pins that are uh, recycled about every 15 seconds. Uh, so you have kind of a small window and it's just rotating these, these six digit pins. If I put it in correctly, then it'll go ahead and let me in. So even though it knows me, uh, in this case, I'm gonna say, look, I, I don't wanna get an email uh, for whatever reason, maybe I don't have access to my email. I don't have this authenticator application. So we're just gonna go basic and old school and I can always let them just go ahead and log in. And you'll notice there's no option here to remember me or anything like that. It already remembers them. This is really part of the second factor. So I'm in. The second one we'll look at is receiving an email. And so I push the button and it says, hey, the login code was sent to your email address. Please validate it in order. So it wants a, a pin from email. We'll hop back over here and we'll take a look at my email. This thing always takes uh, an extra second to load. So you see, I've got an email now and it says, hello, your one-time uh, challenge code has been, here it is. 
and it will expire in 15 minutes. And so that's an important thing. If we remember one of our guiding principles from the beginning when we started building this application was that we wanted this to be secure. And that's why we're encrypting the cookies that are on the machine and we're not kind of passing things around plain text. We're having decryption done on the workflows and things like that. And so we wouldn't just want this pin to sit here in the inbox forever and they could just uh, look at a past pin from last week or last month and put it in and it would work. So it's got a 15 minute timer on it and we'll see how that was accomplished in a minute here. But I'm gonna go ahead and put the pin in and I'm logged in. And the last mechanism, actually we do need to log in, so let's, and you'll see this, this pin is still actually uh, good. It's good for, Actually, it's not good. So what happens is this because it's stored in the session, and that's a new uh, something. You know, we've kind of uh, not just looked at the key fancy features uh, like fingerprinting and um, you know this authenticator app, but we've made use of a lot of lesser known maybe features in the system. And one of the ones we'll look at today and how we're maintaining this 15 minute uh, and or one time use state is through the use of setting a session variable. And because I signed out, my session was cleared. And so even though I came and tried to use that same code, it made me a new code and it sent it. I cannot use the old one because that was part of uh, the last session from when I was a visitor. So I've got a new code, 8238. See, so secure. Now, what I wanna do before we peel back how everything was built is I just wanna go ahead and set this authenticator application up. And we'll, we'll kind of take a look. Uh, it's, it's something, this particular one, there's several out there. Uh, this one's made by Google and it's, it's really easy to uh, set up. I think what's gonna happen if I try to show you this on my phone uh, is that it's, it's not going to take uh, because I have the background blur on, and so it'll it'll blur my phone screen. But uh, I have a, a web page open, and we can take a look. Basically, it's a simple app. You put it on your phone, and it keeps a list of tokens. So a lot of sites use this, banks, different things, and your app can as well. Um, you just hit a plus button to add a new token, and it brings a camera up, and it says, go ahead and scan the token. It's looking for a QR code. So we're going to push, and we've just generated the QR code. And as soon as I hover my camera over this on my phone, I've now got an entry in for the Remember Me app and my uh, email address. And now the pins, the codes are starting to show. So we've got this set up and I will go ahead and sign out. I'm gonna come back in, I'm challenged. Um, and so this one, I'm gonna pick enter the code from the authenticator app. And so it's prompting me for this. And uh, now you can see if I put the code in incorrectly, it's going to tell me, hey, please try again. Remember to submit before your pin changes in the Authenticator app. You have a very, very small window. Like I said, this thing's rotating about every 10, 15 seconds. Uh, and so if, if I put in something that was valid and it just changed like two seconds ago, it'll take it. But after five seconds, it's going to ask you again, and because the whole point of this is security and to make sure someone's not, you know, gaming a system and things like that. And, uh, you know, why this is such a powerful and important uh, mechanism, and I would recommend um, hackers are getting like unbelievably uh, clever. And I, I do a little bit of cryptocurrency dabbling, and I saw that uh, the major exchange that all of this is traded on, it's called Coinbase. Uh, they've got a big problem happening right now uh, where, you know, they send like the email codes, they'll text you a pin Now you can not, you can have second factor not turned on just username and password. But if someone compromises your email uh, or your cell phone, they very easily can um, log in and people are getting hundreds of thousands of dollars wiped out and there's nothing they can do about it because it wasn't Coinbase that got hacked, right? It was you as a user that got hacked. And what people are able to do is if they know your email address or your cell phone number, they will go and trigger the, I forgot my password uh, mechanism. And if they, through your email, they can actually uh, with your, you know, they can go ahead and um, trigger the reset 
take control of your uh, email account. Once they have your email account, you can say, hey, I, I uh, forgot my pin for my phone or anything like that. I wanna port my phone, my SIM over to another card and they will call your carrier and say, hi, it's me, right? And I, I have a new phone device, I have a new SIM card, right? And I don't wanna lose my number, so port me over. And you have like 24 hours and if you don't notice this is happening, they have control of your phone. This is happening a lot. It's kind of a big deal right now. So what can you do about it? The, the thing that's very, very, very hard to beat uh, and is highly recommended by Coinbase and banks and a lot of other sites now, so this is gaining massive adoption, is using one of these authenticator apps and Google's is excellent. Uh, and, and so they, they really would have to, in order to set this up, you know, you've got to have this QR code and, and several different layers, but this thing changes every 10 seconds. Uh, very, very hard to gain this mechanism. And so, uh, you know, I think this is uh, beyond just neat how to build a remember me. I, I think, you know, today is about how to really secure your application when you have certain users that are dealing with very, very sensitive information, healthcare records, financial information, things like that. When, when you have a user that has a lot of power uh, um, and you really maybe want to consider putting something like this in, this is becoming like industry standard stuff. And any app that handles sensitive things that's uh, worth its salt is probably using a mechanism like this. So now that we've kind of seen it all, uh, those are the three, wa three ways. Uh, let's take a look at what prompted this challenge and how we um, set up to be able to um, prompt them for the challenge and allow the different mechanisms to go in. So we'll hop back over kind of uh, where I'm logged in as, as like a super user. And uh, first thing we'll do is we'll, we'll take a look at, you know, we have on our um, login form. So this is the standard login form that, that comes with the application. And we've just done a little surgery and, and made some changes. We saw a couple of weeks ago where we are using the device fingerprint uh, field type, which is uh, pretty powerful and creates these fingerprints. And when you've signaled uh, that you want to be remembered, we have some extra logic that goes on the login button that says, go ahead and not only log them in if they put their username and password incorrectly, but oh yeah, they said they wanted to be remembered. Let me put these encrypted cookies on their machine. So then we saw like when the form loads, it says, okay, let me go and see if, so on the init, we check the cookie for remember me. This one wasn't encrypted, right? Pretty simple thing, like uh, just to say, am I supposed to run this logic? And then we had three different things that uh, would happen here, um, possible kind of outcomes. One is that uh, you're good, I remember you and everything passes and I'm gonna log you right on in automatically. The second one that could be returned back from our, our workflow um, that, that kind of gives us back uh, a login action. And that's what we saw last week. And that login action is either gonna be auto login or challenge. So last week we looked at auto login and how it was passing you through. This week we're looking at what happens when it says challenge. Now the third option is if something went wrong, right? That I couldn't log you in. If you start fidgeting or, or a hacker or somebody starts playing with these encrypted cookies, trying to game the system and these workflows are failing, neither one of those is going to happen if you, if you fundamentally uh, uh, are breaking it. And so what we do is just show a, a toast message to them that says, hey, something's going wrong with auto login, just go ahead and you got to sign in with your username and password. Um, but today what we want to look at, and we had a little placeholder here, a, a message box at the time uh, that was, uh, and I went ahead and disabled this message box. Um, th this time, uh, but last week, what you would have saw is, hey, kind of coming soon, right? And, and uh, you need to pick something and, and go in. Uh, so I just kind of left this here to show like, that's, that's what, what we had as we were building incrementally. Um, what we're doing now, though, is um, we're able to detect this. And Manu, you set this part up. You want to tell me how, once this returns back and says that we need to challenge, how is it that we're not showing the standard login form, but we're actually showing the, the other set of options, the three buttons that are for um, the second factor authentication. So what check are we doing 
Um, Basically, uh, it depends what uh, you get from the workflow that uh, runs the initial. Um, how do I say? It? So, so basically, the initial logic, uh, and if it uh, will return challenge, then we're we're going to initialize a different form where uh, the user can choose between the options. Okay, so let's take a look at that form. And we could have, like, as you saw here, I had a message box, and you have the ability to include buttons and things, right? Uh, so I could have done this here. It, it started making the login form kind of heavy. It's already got some logic going on with the remember me and the cookies and stuff. So we said, hey, let's go ahead and just create a new form called custom challenge menu, right? And so that's this form here. So what we do is when we detect that it's a challenge on the initialization of the login form, we basically say, go ahead and initialize this challenge uh, menu form, custom challenge menu. And so custom challenge menu, really, it's pretty simple. It's got some static text that is basically saying, hey, we remember you. But you know, there was a message that came back. So it could be that your device has changed. If the fingerprints didn't match is another check we do. Today, we're just kind of keeping it simple. And I didn't want to mess with trying to uh, trick the thing into thinking my device has changed. Just easier to, to put a different IP address in and let it see that my IP doesn't match. And so it's just showing this text. And then there's the three buttons, log in with my credentials, enter code from email, uh, enter code from authenticator app. Now, one, one thing we're doing though, is that on initialization of this form. So this form by default is set to not initialize. It, there's a setting here that says display mode, right? And you have, is it initially visible? That's the login form. It's always, I know I'm, that's the main point of the page. I wanna show this form here. I can say, hey, I want to show it on a separate page. I want to show it in a pop-up and raise it up via a pop-up. And that's what's happening. And we'll check that out on the other forms of when I say I want to do the email pin or the custom challenge from the authenticator application. Those forms are set to open in pop-up. And I'm just uh, triggering to, uh, to raise that pop-up. In this case, though, I'm saying that I want it to be manually chosen to be displayed, which means this form, nothing happens with it. It's kind of ignored when the page renders. And I have to trigger an event to make this form happen. And so that's what we're doing here uh, when we're with the action of initialize form and stop execution. We're saying, hey, trigger the initialization of, and you, it, it's aware of any forms on the page. And we're saying the custom challenge menu form in this case. And so that's this form. And when this form first initializes, then there's something we want to do. It would look kind of silly to say, uh, hey, we know you but you got some choices to make and still have the login form on the page. So what we do is we, we have kind of a fair assumption. The only time this form's ever gonna come into play is if I'm executing as part of the remember me logic and I've detected a situation where I wanna challenge the user. Well, if I'm challenging the user, I want this form. I don't want the login form. And so we just run a little bit of JavaScript here that um, hides the login form. And so again, part of uh, uh, what has been so great about what started out as such a simple concept, remember them and log them in, is making use of a lot of things in our, in our toolkit that we have. And one of them is uh, kind of a handy way to, through JavaScript, make use of some of the Angular APIs that are available in forms and grids and things like that. And there's a function here called hide form. And uh, so, it's dnnsf.api.action form. You could say dot action grid dot, you know, uh, most of the kind of major modules like that have things exposed. And in this case, action form, one of the things that has exposed is hide form. And you just give it uh, the ID of the form. Uh, and the ID of the form for the login on this app is 379. And so when we give that, uh, we're just saying hide, and I'm just doing an extra jQuery call here to, um, there was a little bit of artifacts left behind because we're on a green screen and it was a white background form and stuff like that. So it was leaving a little white box behind. So I just also went ahead and said, hey, jQuery, hide this, right? So all we're doing through a uh, one action, really, is just a JavaScript action, is saying, hey, go ahead, as soon as the 
the menu for custom challenge initializes itself. The very first thing it should do is hide the login form so we don't see that and it's out of the way. And um, so the first thing we'll look at, you had some choices and I said, we'll kind of go in order of complexity or coolness. And, and since we were on this whole topic of showing and hiding the forms, uh, I said, well, first simplest thing I can do is let the user go, okay, you know what, you wanna, you wanna challenge me? That's fine, let me just give you my credentials and log in and be done with it. Or for whatever reason, I don't have access to these mechanisms, I haven't set up the authenticator app, whatever, right? So when I push this button, you're gonna see that this page basically reloads and there's the login form. Why isn't it challenging me, right? And you'll notice there's a, a pretty simple little trick I did here. There's just a query string parameter uh, called force login and it's set to one. You, equivalent of true. And if we go back to the login form, you'll see that when it goes to first do the logic that even says, you know, uh, do they have remember me enabled and things like that, you'll notice here. So before all this logic would even run to even check is remember me in play, I'm saying, look, skip all of that. Normally what we had last week was, hey, if in the cookie, because we go here from the cookie and we check, hey, that remember me cookie, what's it set to? Is it set to true? And we just put it here into a token that we can use in the next action. Well, this is what we had before. Hey, if remember me is true, go run all the remember me logic. Go figure that out. If it's a user who doesn't have remember me set, let's not run this logic, right? Unless they've chosen to be remembered, that cookie is set. None of this normally factors in. And all I've done here is I've said, hey, go up to the query string. And, and see if uh, a parameter called force login, uh, as I've mentioned in the, in the past, I always, whenever I have mission critical tokens that I'm dealing with, um, I, I always like to default them in case they don't exist, just so there's never any confusion. Uh, sometimes when you're doing evaluations and you're trying to check something that's maybe numeric, uh, but uh, an empty string or a text value, you're gonna get um, sometimes conflicts going, hey, I can't uh, check this thing as an integer when this is text. So I just always find one personally, I like to work with numbers a lot of times, it's just cleaner and easier. Um, and, and so I, I do this little equals whatever, and it's a way to go ahead and say, hey, if I don't have anything, fall back to this. So if there was nothing for uh, this force login up here, which normally there isn't, right? Then it gets treated like it's there with a zero when this check is happening, okay? So it's always got a value, it's zero. Now in this case, I'm just basically saying when it's not a one, run the logic. Well, in this case, it's a one. And so it stops and doesn't run the logic. I also, because, and you'll notice there's no remember me option here, right? If this force login is here, I kind of know I'm in a challenge situation. Um, this was also handy if you're a developer, right? And you're working with this form and you want to see what's going on and you don't want the custom challenge stuff to get shown. You could just hand type this in. So it was kind of neat. This was one of the first things we did when we were building this. And, you know, we started small and we said, hey, let's just let them sign in. Uh, and, and so well, we had to get access to this form once we started having the hiding of it happening and the other form showing. And I'm like, wait, I wanna see what's going on on the other form. I could just type this in up here. So that A is kind of a handy trick sometimes that you can do is you can seed uh, logic into your forms, your pages, different things where you can put a, a stop type uh, uh, parameter up there and then tell your thing, hey, look, you've got all this complex logic, things that are going to happen. But as the developer, I kind of just need a way to stop you so I can fix things. You're running amok. I'm stuck in an endless loop for that. That happened to me when I was first building this. So having uh, something like this force login or stop execution, whatever you want to call it, and only you know about it, right? And there's really not really any harm in it. Uh, most people won't ever know it's there. And if you did, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? They're just seeing the login form and they have to log in. So it's not like they've gotten past the system in any way. And so we also just make use of that here on the uh, remember me checkbox. Um, oh, sorry, that's the hidden one. Oh, it's a binding. So uh, I didn't want the field not to render. So when I submit, it's still a login form, right? So I put it down here and that's kind of a good point. Uh, always read these handy tips underneath things, but you'll see this show conditionally 
uh, it's there, it's handy, it's right in front of you. Just know that that's happening server side. And so that means the, the form will have no knowledge of a field called remember me. And so maybe if I've got some other workflows and things that are expecting this to be passed in, well, now it's nothing. It's, it's like uh, I can't use it in brackets in the token syntax. The way to kind of get around that if you're just visually hiding something is to use the show on the bind expression. That's client side, that's JavaScript. And so here I just said, hey, if get force login is equal to zero, go ahead and show this. It's looking for a true statement. It's asking you, should I show this, true or false? Well, if there's nothing up there for force login, it's a zero and that equals zero, that's gonna, that Boolean evaluates as true. In my case here though, there is something there, it's a one. So one does not equal zero, therefore it's not showing that field. And it just didn't wanna confuse the user going, wait a minute, why are you asking me if you want, if I wanna be remembered, right? We're, we're entering this form in a different state because it was triggered from the standpoint of uh, a challenge. And so all then that we're doing is uh, when you push the button, over here on our challenge menu form. So when I say log in with my credentials, it's very simple, one action, redirect to URL. And I'm saying, hey, just redirect them to the login page and pass in a parameter for force login. And oh, by the way, if there was something in to return URL, right? So maybe I've bookmarked a page, I come and it's handy, I've got remember me, but uh oh, I'm, uh, I'm on a different IP, I'm signed in somewhere else, my device has changed whatever reasons I wanted to challenge them for, I still don't want them to go to the home page. I do want to send them to where they were headed. I'm just putting a, hey, one second here, let me make sure you're you. And so all it does is redirect the page. And we just saw that the form is set to, set to ignore uh, all of the normal remember me logic and just prompt you to log in. You log in successfully, as we saw, then you're logged in. And then next time, if your IP is not different, whatever. Now, you know, there's so much you can do with this. We stopped it here. What would happen, as you see, is I've got my IP different. So every single time I'm getting challenged, right? Now, in reality, I could store or look up, uh, have I seen this IP anywhere before? If it's a known IP, good. So what I could do after they log in is say, hey, this IP they're at right now, put it in some table of known or whitelisted IPs. And uh, actually, you know, we have our login details. I could just put another entry in there and query and say, have I seen this IP anywhere, right? Anywhere, not specifically tied to this fingerprint. I know it's a device that's good. That would be kind of next stuff as you're incrementing. So now we want to look at the next button, which was the email. And so I'm going to invite, um, Manu to tell us a little bit about this. So what happens on our menu here, our challenge menu form, is I push this and apparently there's another form that is loading as a pop-up and it's asking me for this email pin. It sent me the email. So let's take a look at that form and see how it's uh, wired up. So it's called custom challenge email. It's got a text box that's going to prompt us for a pin and uh, it's got a submit and a cancel button. So Manu, tell us a little bit about what's going on here. I see the first action you're doing uh, is a execute token and it's to get a code from a session. So kind of give me a high level of what does this form do? Uh, um, and once it's raised up and I hit this submit button, you know, like uh, what's happened from the moment that I clicked to say, enter a code from an email and then it raised this form. So we should actually probably back up a step um, and take a look at enter code from email, which was the button we pushed first. Yeah, the idea of it's pretty simple. So basically you generate a random code, then that code you save it in the session and also send it to the client. Then we on this button compare the values. Uh, it, uh, if you, it will uh, return true, then we'll log him in will execute the workflow that logs him in. Otherwise, we'll throw an error message so he can check it again or, I don't know, or request it again. Okay. So basically what we see here is, now remember, we're on this point, this is the custom challenge menu, and I've pushed the button that says enter code from email. So what it's doing is calling a workflow that generates a one-time code and sends it to the user. So let's take a look at so the by ID simpler. 
Thank you. Send random email code. Yep. So this one, what does it do? Uh, so first, um, I I retrieve the cookies because uh, you'll uh, require the username so you can get the email to which you can send the random code. Okay, so this is a actually a, a call, an execution of a different workflow that we have uh, called get cookies. And all it's doing is reading the cookies off of whatever the current user's machine is. So rather than go and try to run these actions every time, we just made a workflow that makes it really convenient. You don't have to notice this workflow has no inputs. Uh, it's going to read right off the machine. So now I've got the cookies uh, off the machine for the fingerprint and the username that the, that is remembered. Yeah, now we're are decrypted. Yeah. Okay. So we run our workflow that we saw last week, uh, kind of a little utility workflow that will take in any encrypted values and decrypt them. And so now I've gotten the cookies and I've decrypted the looks like the username is the one I care about. And we're just running a SQL query. Yeah. And basically okay. retrieving all the data that we might need. So user ID and email. Okay. So now I know who the user is. Looks like there's a token that's running. What does this one do? Uh, this one generates the random code. Uh, okay. It's a simple uh, a a token. Look. So we've got a little helper namespace here, and these are just little functions and utilities. And this one that we're looking at is called random code. So I'm going to do a save and test. And you can see every time I push it, I've got an output down below. The number, four digit number is getting generated. And so this is C sharp code, I take it, because it's a razor token in C sharp. Yep. And it looks like, you know, this is, so you have the ability to run uh, in these razor tokens. Um, C sharp code, and it's it's without really having to do much. So, how are you a programmer? Like, how did you know to to do this? No, of course, but most of the time you can search for. I search, for example, for uh, get the uh, random number in Razor, and uh, I it was quite easy to find uh, an option, and I didn't need to change it too much. I basically just added a start number. So I don't get random numbers from one to uh, 9,000. Okay, so this looks pretty simple. It's really, you know, four lines of actual code and, and um, you know, a little bit of syntax. And so kind of the, the message here is that Google is your friend and there is a ton, a ton of really useful little functions and widgets and, and things that you can do with these Razor tokens, if you just Google a little bit, and you can either say, you know, C sharp function four, but but kind of better in this case, Razor and C sharp, very, very similar. Razor is more for um, C sharp on the web, right? Not compiled C sharp. And so I would recommend when you're Googling is, is look for like Razor, C sharp, whatever you're looking for, function that generates random numbers validate two strings, trim the length of something, whatever you, you need is a little utility. Also, uh, I'll put a plug in that, remember a, a, you know, a few releases ago, we've got the execute JavaScript action, and it also um, you know, can be run in a workflow and very similar ton of stuff you can Google on, on JavaScript, little handy functions and things that you pass some stuff in. It can do some magic and pass you something out. And so the result of this token, see, we've got a variable here that, that had the calculations done on it. And what ends up rendering out is this variable with that at sign. And so anytime I run this, uh, I'm just getting a code. So let's hop back over Rosa? then to, yes, sir. Yeah, I'm just going to give you your 10 minute warning. Thank you, Dale. You got to keep me honest. All right, Manu, I'm going to hustle you a little bit here. So it looks like now uh, this one is another token that we're running. Uh, yeah, it's once we have, yeah, once we have the random code, we can save it in the session. So we can compare it later with the one that uh, we're going to send to the with the with uh, the value that we're going to send to the client. 
Okay. And, um, you know, just a, a tip again, any of these um, core tokens that are here, you can look up and they give you good examples and you can test them, you know, right, right down below. So this is another one, you know, we looked at cookies and how we could store things in cookies. We know that we can put stuff in the URL and the query string. We can also set things into the user session. And as you saw, if I sign out, I close my browser window. Next time I come back and sign in, a new session is generated. And so this is only as good as your session. And I found that these last uh, about 15 minutes of idle, right? So if I'm just sitting there on that screen, staring at it, doing nothing, for about 15 minutes, my, my session is gonna expire and that code won't work. So just kind of know you got about a 15 minute timer uh, on, on these session variables. So now I've set session and then it looks like we just go ahead and use a simple send email. We send them their code and we know who they, that's why we looked up who the user was so we could have their email address handy. Um, and now I've sent them that. So kind of looking a little bit quick. Now I've sent them an email. The next action that, um, oops, that we do, the last action, is to go ahead and open the action form pop-up, and that's our custom challenge email form. So I, the user hit the button. I ran a workflow that just went ahead and took care of everything for me. Hey, grab the stuff off their machine, send them an email with their pin, and now it's sitting here. It's raised the other form. The form is waiting to take their input. And so let's take a quick, oh, maybe it's this one. So when they submit, you know, we've got this text box here for their pin. When they submit it, we didn't go workflow here. Uh, we're just doing kind of a, a, a quick thing. We're not setting the session. So set session would have let us set it. It looks like just session and whatever that you name the thing is going to get from the session. So we grab the code uh, from the session that was set by the other button push. And then it looks like you just do a comparison to what they put in the text box and what is in session. If they don't match, we show a toast, kind of telling them try again. Yeah. If they do match, we have a workflow that basically uh, just generates an auto login link and logs them in. So that's the gist of that. I know we're a little tight on time, so I just wanted to show really quickly um, how the Authenticator stuff works. So Google Authenticator, they have their own API uh, and you can use you know, our server request actions and things to do that. But we found a really handy thing here and we'll, we'll include links uh, in probably the YouTube video and, and uh, things like that. Maybe when we send out the email or something, but we'll make sure we give some links to this stuff. But it's just authenticatorapi.com. And what they've done is made a little C Sharp app and they're hosting it here. Um, kind of, uh, uh, so you can see here that it's on GitHub and this thing's pretty cool. Uh, it's a pretty small project. So if you compiled this and put it out on your own website or web hosting, you would basically be having these APIs made available, uh, that you can call. And it's just very simple. You give them an app name, uh, like a username and then a secret code. And when you do that, it basically returns back to you a QR code that gets generated that took that information into account. And with the Google Authenticator application, when I hold my camera over that QR code, it knows to go ahead and register that I'm good, I'm the person that's gonna be using this code. And similarly, they have one other little API. It's for validating and you give it again, the secret code and whatever the pin that the user is trying to say. So in this case, they've kind of, they're showing that they're going to call with this secret code. And if I put in, you know, a good pin, it'll work. If I put in a bad pin, it won't work. So I went ahead and made use of this. I just want to make clear that this is a neat thing I found online. Officially as plant an app, I'm not endorsing this. I can't promise you that this thing is going to be around forever or anything like that. It was really just meant to show how you can do two factor. You can always go to the Google documentation. They have APIs and you can set this up through Google. You could get the open source uh, project of this, compile it up and host it. I think this thing is so cool that I'm going to talk to the team. And if they take a look at this and the code looks sound, we might host something like this up on our end and maybe make it available as an API or something, or at least instructions on how you can build and host and control 
this code and this project on your side, but it is open source. And so uh, kind of with the, and maybe this is gonna be a, a, a part four, but all I do is I have some pretty simple calls that are uh, calling that API, the authenticator API, and I'm just passing in uh, the secret code and the secret code I'm just generating um, with a random number similar to what Manu was doing. I store that secret code. So I made an entity for the user um, called user authentications. And so you can see all I did here is I keep the username, the secret code that was generated, and then the payload that comes back from that API is basically just some HTML that's got all the goodies needed to render the QR code. And then on the page here, that is like your account page, and you saw that when I pushed the button, I just am calling that workflow that sets all this up uh, and then gives me back. And so I just query this entity and say, um, if this user has, you know, go ahead and find the value for this user that's signed in right now. And it's just a static text field on a form. So this is just the whole thing's an action form. The button makes the call to the workflow, which calls that API, stores this off. When the form initializes, though, it goes and says, do I have a record for this user? Do they have a QR code? Yeah, great. Go ahead and throw it into a static text field. So now they can, anytime I log in from any device, these aren't unique to device. This is tied to me as the user. I can come from Chrome from iPad, from anywhere, and just hold my, my phone over this and say, okay, I've, I can now set up uh, this. So it's kind of universal. So I think we're, we're out of time, unfortunately. Um, maybe uh, in a couple of weeks when I go to show some of the new features, like uh, kind of a, a teaser here. So as you can see, like uh, I do love my workflows, but we didn't use workflows everywhere. Manu had his stuff in tokens, right? But you can see how just to do a feature like this is probably almost 20 workflows, right? I think we deleted one or two test ones. So it's about 18 workflows and kind of growing. Well, this isn't even my main app. This is just to handle Remember Me. And so this gets very unruly. And that's that's a, a, a sneak for a feature I want to show you guys in a couple of weeks, which is having namespace now. So you can say, like, I could have a Remember Me namespace, a utility namespace, and I could put all these workflows that are purely for that purpose together and group them there, and then I'll be able to filter on that. So as my app grows and I have 40, 50, 60 workflows, how do I find things, right? And I'm not, I can't remember them all. I can just um, put them in these namespaces like the tokens have and, and makes it a lot easier. So if you use good descriptions and good naming and the namespaces, you're gonna have a good, good chance to organize your workflows better. And so when we look at that in a couple of weeks uh, and I've got these grouped, we'll take a peek at uh, what we did with a couple of these authenticator workflows. But at the end of the day, it's it really came down to just making the API calls to this thing and getting the, it, it's the one telling me if I'm good or not, right? I give it a pin and I give it the secret code and it returns back a true false, essentially. Are they authenticated or not? And all I'm doing is similar to the email logic. I just do a check that says, if this thing told me I'm good, auto log them in. If it didn't, prompt them again. Same concept, same pattern, uh, just using a different mechanism. Thanks everyone for joining the plant a cat webinar. <laughs> I planted one in the video. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> Dale also posted a feedback uh, form in the chat window. It really helps us improve. So please, uh, please uh, send us your feedback and uh, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, see you again next week.